I'm grateful to Ellie for inviting me. It is very meaningful for me. My full lecture will be during the Holocaust week on Thursday, November 7, at Richmond Hill Public Library. I would be delighted if some of you were able to attend. I was honored to record my memories for the Spielberg collection that includes 50,000 Holocaust stories. This makes it possible to better understand the mysteries of survival. I will say a few words about the ways that my survival story differs from many others. I was with my family in Italian concentration camps and this cannot be compared to the Nazi extermination camps. I vividly remember when the Germans entered Zagreb, Croatia. We closed all the blinds and I heard my father crying. This is the only time that I heard my father cry and it has such an effect that until recently I couldn't cry, even under the most difficult circumstances. Within two months after the German invasion, a Yugoslav partisan movement started. The partisan movement was organized by the Communist Party, but less than 90% of the partisans were not communists. The purpose of the partisan movement was to destroy fascism in Yugoslavia. It was by far the largest anti-fascist movement in Europe, and the number of partisans in Yugoslavia grew from 80,000 to 780,000, almost a million. <coughs> Many Jews had high-ranking positions in the partisan army, in which there was no overt anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, the purpose of the communists was also to establish a dictatorial communist government once the war ended. When the fascists took control of Croatia, I gradually felt more and more as if I was being transformed into somebody without protection and who could be humiliated or exterminated without explanation. This reminds me of Kafka's famous story, Metamorphosis, in which he wrote that Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams and found himself transformed in bed into a gigantic insect. In this way, Gregor Samsa was considered different than anybody else, and he was helpless. The power of Kafka's predictions is unbelievable. The survival of Jews in Croatia was 25%. This is a terrible number, but it was worse in some other countries. The survivals are due to the partisan war, protection in Italian zones, and protection of mixed marriages. Most of my relatives were killed in Ustasha or Nazi extermination camps. After the war, I grew up in an environment in which my grandmother would speak every day about her two sons who were brutally killed. It was a difficult environment for the psychological development of a teenager. Immediately after the fascist government was established, an Italian colonel, who was a member of the Italian embassy, was ordered to stay in our apartment in Zagreb. Paradoxically, we were fortunate because this provided us with temporary protection. Nevertheless, my mother grew nervous, so in autumn 41, the Italian colonel drove my mother and me to a small Adriatic resort. We drove through the mountains covered with thick snow. Suddenly, there was trouble with the car and some people came running towards the vehicle. The colonel was in panic because he believed that these were partisans. So he and his driver kneeled and prayed. However, these strangers turned out to be Italian soldiers. After my mother and I arrived safely, the colonel helped my grandmother and my father take a train, escorted by Italian soldiers, to join us. 
The colonel did it for humanitarian reasons. Eventually, some 3,600 Jews escaped, escaped to various parts of the Dalmatian coast, which was controlled by the Italian army. The small, resolve, the small resort was still safe, since it was under Italian control. However, Bismarck, the German ambassador to Rome, who was the grandson of one of the greatest statesmen that Germany ever had, was not particularly bright, and he desperately wanted to achieve something important. He urged Mussolini to hand over 3,600 Jews who were spread around the Dalmatian coast to, to the Germans. This request was from the foreign minister Ribbentrop and Hitler himself. Bismarck stated that the Jews in Croatia were spies and threat to the German Reich. Mussolini signed Nulla Osta, which meant that he approved of the request to hand us over to the Germans who would ship us to Auschwitz. The document went to the Italian foreign ministry, but we were not handed over. Instead, we were sent to a concentration camp in a nearby city. Thus, paradoxically, this camp saved our life since we were not handed over. The, this camp had horse stables where men were lodged and some barracks where the women stayed. The conditions in the camp were primitive. However, the Italians gave us materials that were necessary to improve the conditions. The Italians selected three people, including my father, to be in charge of the concentration camp. This facilitated communication between the inmates and the Italian officers. I worked in a clinic brigade, and every night I was given a potato, or a piece of cheese, or a piece of polenta. Fantastic delicacies. <laughs> I'm sure that my wife Linda is very grateful that I was a professional cleaner early on in my life but the cleaning standards of the camp do not fully satisfy her standards. <laughs> In the camp, the inmates organized a regular school. The, school of, the quality of the school was better than the high school that I attended later in Italy or in communist Yugoslavia. An incredible experience occurred when General Roata, who was in charge of Italian army in Dalmatia, visited the camp and addressed the inmates as gentlemen prisoners, signori prigionieri. This shows the enormous difference between Italian and German army. The German told us that he wished that he could put us into a submarine so that we would be safe until the end of the war. <clears throat> In order to protect us even more, we were sent to another camp on a beautiful island, Raab, which was part of Italy at that time. And it became the concentration camp for all the Jews from Dalmatia, which is 3,600. When Italy collapsed, our camp was dismantled. We were free. However, we were in mortal danger because we knew that partisans could not control Dalmatia. We expected any day the Germans would occupy Rab. Younger people joined the partisans, and the battalion, the Jewish battalion in Rab, was the only Jewish battalion formed during the War of Resistance. Miraculously, their survival was 85 percent. The British Brigadier General Fitzroy MacLean suggested a life-saving idea to Churchill, namely, a southern island in the Adriatic, called Vis, became a stronghold for partisans and allied forces. This facilitated the transport of wounded partisans to southern Italy, which was occupied by the allied forces. At the end of December 43, we reached the mainland, 
My father asked the partisans whether a boat taking wounded partisans to Vis could take us as well. After 14 days of great nervousness, we were finally told that the ship named Emma would pick us up at 5 p.m. We waited and waited in the harbor from 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. This was a question of life and death. Finally, we heard a thundering noise from the boat's diesel engine. There were 15 of us and we were on the top of the boat where the wounded partisans were below. Of the 3,600 Jews that were in the camp, a large number joined the partisans, either as fighters or to get protection. By the time our boat arrived at Rab, there were still 300 Jews left. Unfortunately, the boat could only hold another 50. It was terrible watching people frantically trying to enter the boat. Three weeks later, the Germans arrived and sent 250 people to Auschwitz. Only three women survived. It took three nights for the partisan boats to take us to the island Vis, which now was protected by the Allied forces and partisans. It was the three most beautiful and most dangerous nights, continuously watching the splendor of the stars at night. During the day, we would rest on one part of the island, where the Germans were already in another part of the island. The noise of our diesel boat was such that it could easily be detected. But finally, when we were in Vis, after two weeks, a British cruiser took us to the entire mainland, which was under occupation of Allied forces. We were now safe. We settled in Taranto, where my mother worked for the British Army. After a year, my father returned to Yugoslavia to join the partisans. After the war ended, we returned to Croatia and it took me some time to get used to normal life. Eventually, I finished medical school and a PhD in physiology. Fifty years ago, I came to Canada with my late wife, and two-year-old Eva. She looks to me still two years old. <laughs> Together with Eva, we face the opportunities and challenges of immigration. It is marvelous that in addition to Eva, I have two other daughters, Anne and Claire, who is my wife, Linda. I devoted myself, as you heard, to research, mentoring, and administration in physiology at the University of Toronto, where I was chair of the department, specializing in diabetes research. I'm particularly proud that I'm the last postdoctoral fellow of Professor Charles Best, one of the, one of the four discoverers of insulin that, saved, that are saving millions and millions of lives. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Vranich, for your presentation. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, and I'd like to start off with one, of, one question which I was intrigued by, which is, if I'm, if I'm correct, you were not raised Jewish, and yet you were still uh, interned by the Nazis. Can you explain a bit about how that happened? Uh, it didn't matter. I, I was born Christian because my parents changed the religion, ten, my father changed the religion ten years before I was born. But that had no significance whatsoever. What was important was the racial background. Uh, if, if you had three grandfathers who were Jewish, you were Jewish. But did you even know you were Jewish until this happened? I learned when I was in high school, um, when I was 10 years old. We were playing a game which was chasing the Jews. So I came home and told my parents. And then my parents told me that I'm of Jewish background. Hmm. But at that time, it didn't have any impact on me. 
because I never faced anti-Semitism. And the, the game in the school was more like tax. Tax? Well, like tax. playing games. Yeah. Like tax. Tax. And, okay. and when I ask my colleagues from the school, they don't, don't even remember it. So I never faced anti-Semitism until the fascists came. And how did they know you were Jewish? <laughs> they knew. <laughs> they, they, Germans, well, the Germans and the, and the Croatian fascists had very good records. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why we know how many Jews were, were killed, because of the German records. Mm -hmm. And were both your parents originally Jewish or your father? Yeah, yeah. my mother changed the religion before she married. So, and did they the change, background is fully Jewish. And did they change the religion out of convenience or just... Uh, my father changed because in Croatia he felt that he's not in the mainstream. So that the, the, the decision had nothing to do with religion. Mm -hmm. he, was a, he was a mathematician, very well known. And he felt that in order to be in the mainstream, it, he had to change his name from Schwarz to Vranic. Mm. And, and, uh, but it still didn't work out completely, because he was told when he got his PhD in mathematics that he can be a private docent, which is like assistant professor, but he, that he could never yeah. follow academic career. Nevertheless, he taught courses, had books. One of his books, written after the war, is still used. Uh, examined students, was very well known, but worked for an insurance company, which uh, they let him do it, and he did research too. So it, it and, and my mother was, was uh, well to do. And what was your mother's maiden name? Berger. Berger, it's also a Jewish name. Jewish name from Hungary. Mm -hmm. And the Schwarz is from Austria. Mm -hmm. But 250 years ago. Hmm. Anybody have any other questions? No, I, I just wondered whether um, your family's experience in dealing with the Italians was mimicked by other uh, treatment of Jewish populations within Italy, or um, it was just happened to you happen to be in a very a more protective um, area. Uh, I'm, I'm writing my memoirs. So, so there will be a lot of details about it. Yeah. Uh, one, one of our friends who died in the meantime, Esti Bem, gave every year many lectures about her survival. Her, her route was different. They escaped to northern Italy. And they were quite safe. You know, they, she saw that everybody knew that they were Jewish, but that was never a question raised until Italy collapsed and the Germans entered. Then, actually, a fascist came and told them disappear. So they disappeared in the mountains. They were treated very nicely about the local people and ended in a lot small village. So Italians in general were not anti-Semitic. There were fascist exceptions. We often hear that <coughs> this language growing up, um, you know, it, it, it happened in, in Germany and in Europe, and um, it certainly took, I think it took people by surprise that, that this would happen. In your wisdom, do you think something like this, God forbid, could happen again in the world, or in North America. I'm sure it's happened in the world, or four in many other places, but let's say North America. Of course I hope not, because there is a different situation. Uh, the Jews in North America are in the mainstream. You know, you cannot imagine University of Toronto, Nobel Prize winners, and so on, without the considerable Jewish presence. So it's very different than, than in Europe. That's my hope for North America. Of course. Yeah. Uh, 
human nature, that's, that's a big puzzle. I mean, Germans were completely assimilated in Germany. They had very important positions. German Jews. Yeah. That's right. Uh, in Vienna. In Vienna, the music, the, 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 the art, the writing was largely Jewish. And, they, and nobody expected that this, this would happen. So therefore, it's very hard to predict. I have a non-Holocaust related topic question. What was it like to work under Dr. Best? Well, this is the third part of my book, which is called <laughs> An Immigrant. The title will be An Immigrant, Always an Immigrant with a Question Mark. <laughs> <laughs> the, the book will have attractive title in order to attract people to, uh -huh. to, to read it. Uh, I came and the, the Slovakian lady who was a professor and who helped me coming to, to Canada looked at Charlie Best. Charlie Best was Visok, quite a strong individual at that time, about 60. And she asked him, what do you think about Granich? And he turned half of his head, said, his English is pretty good, otherwise I don't know. And uh, he was very good to young people. And what he really did, he invited me to give a seminar of my PhD from Croatia. And he was extremely enthusiastic, and helped me to, to, to publish it in, in the top journal here. And that was the beginning of my career. But, he and his father and his son suffered from depressions. Mm. So after I worked with him for a year and a half, he had a terrible depression. So he spent, I think, two years in a hospital. The, the big thing about Best is not only that he was one of the co-discoverers, which really put, that put the University of Toronto on the map. Suddenly, the Torontonians said, okay, we can do it. Yeah. It was one of the most important medical discoveries and very dramatic because type 1 diabetic children, there was no treatment. Treatment was starvation. So these little kids would get 500 calories per day. They would look like skeletons and that would prolong their life for two or three years. You know, and then came insulin. Suddenly, that was not a problem anymore as it looked. But he knew that the work is necessary. It became more and more clear that despite insulin treatment, there are lots of complications. And these complications are terrible. So it's, it's due to him that we have today many camps for diabetic children, that we found at Canadian Diabetes Association, he supported the American, which is the most important. <clears throat> and, and he had an institute in which uh, everybody was visiting. It was like a big marketplace, either visiting or having or doing a PhD or postdoc or XD or work there. So it, uh, Toronto was on the map. Hmm. He was a very strong individual. And as I say, the problem became, there, there was another problem. And this is that two people got the Nobel Prize for it. And one was Bantic, and that was his idea. And the other was McLeod, who was the chairman of the department, and who told Bantic how this has to be done. Bantic didn't have any experience. Best was a student, pre-med student. So he didn't start medicine yet. He worked with Bantu, but he didn't get the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a life problem for him to accept. Mm -hmm. Because for some strange reasons, you can have many awards, but if you have the Nobel Prize, everything else doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not a good thing. And that bothered best. Did he, did he deserve the Did he deserve it? 
Yeah, that was discussed endlessly. <laughs> by the, even by the Nobel Committee. The Nobel Committee reevaluated it. They, they cannot make a change. Mm -hmm. But they reevaluated re the whole thing. Uh, he was a student. He, he was extremely important because today it is nothing, but then at that time it was, it was very difficult to measure blood pressure and in relatively small amounts, and he knew how to do it. The other problem was with Banting, that he came, he was in the First World War doing orthopedic surgery without much training. That mean, meant cutting the legs without anesthesia. And people think that he had a post-traumatic syndrome. So that Banting's mood was swinging. And best, best was necessary to make sure that the experiments are done if Banting had his problems. Mm. It's, it's a very interesting story. Mm. So any, any last questions? I have one last question. Anybody else want to ask more questions besides for me? My last question is, what is your best advice uh, about avoiding diabetes in the first place? What's your best advice? Yeah, that's very simple. It's exercise and diet. Lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and, and that became very clear. I was the first to be invited to, to get the first small symposium about exercise and diabetes. That was some 40 years ago or more. At that time, it was, exercise was not so terribly, considered so terribly important. And there was a small group of people who concentrated on it. And then this, that, that told me, that's, that was then an avalanche of similar meetings. And then finally, epidemiolog epidemiologists have a definite proof that exercise can prevent type 2 diabetes. So it's very dramatic. Of course, control of body weight is equally important. Now, our further work, which, which was... So, so, just to mention, at the time when I worked in... when I came to Toronto, my preceptor, Jerry Redshaw, was a type 1 diabetic. For him, his routine was after each meal to walk. He believed that exercise was important. Then we started experiments in dogs which, in which we removed the pancreas. So they were totally diabetic. Exercise actually deteriorated the blood sugar. Mm. So this started the whole story. And then we explained under which condition if, if the sugar is well controlled, the insulin, then it's fine. So we explained this, and then one of the trainers called me and said, now finally I understand why some diabetics have problems and some profit from it. And the best result of all of that is that I had two postdocs, a lady called, <coughs> a lady and a man, and at a different time, they both climbed the highest mountain in, uh, in, in Africa. So that was not, that was in, both type 1 diabetics, that mm. was inconceivable 50 years ago. But then came one surprise, and that's the big question of stress. We all know that stress can accelerate diabetes, maybe induce diabetes. But when we did experiments with rats, which were diabetic, we would put them into little plastic tubings so they were not compressed, but they couldn't move. That was stress for them, neurogenic stress. But we did it five times per week for many weeks. After a few Initially, when they, they put them in, it was stress. All the stress hormones and sugar, everything went sky high. But gradually, they got used to it. And they, actually, in this group of rats, which develops diabetes, because it's a special group of rats, 
with, with this kind of stress, they did not develop diabetes. So, the, our conclusion was that adaptation, if you can adapt to stress, it's actually useful. So it's not so simple. No. Yeah. And then when people ask me how to adapt to stress, I tell them this is not my business as a physiologist. <laughs> this is the question of psychiatrists, psychologists. Can I suggest, suggest the answer? Come to synagogue more often. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, Dr. Varanich, for sharing your history and your words of wisdom with us. And I think we're all thinking the same thing. I mean, the Nazis murdered six million Jews. And look how many other brilliant people could have made contributions to society like Dr. Varanich has done. So a big hand for sharing your story. Thank you.